episode 82 of Teh Tarik with Wallet, we have two civil society legends with me. And I think this is the 15th anniversary of one of the most significant episodes. This day, in... this hour. Is it? Yes. So it's this exact day? Oh. 2nd May and then 12 p.m. people were streaming in Sunset Hall. Oh wow! This day so the exact day and exact time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> so fifteen years, <laughs> 15 years of uh, the saga, 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 saga incident, and where there was an attempted, well, su initially successful attempted uh, conservative takeover of aware. And I think to know more details, the juicy details, please listen to the podcast, the narrative podcast that was done by aware. And I, I listened to it as I'm sure you did as well, Remy. It was very gripping. And uh, both both of my guests today, they were involved directly in that incident, but not just in that incident. They have been around for civil society for the longest time. So Corinna is the executive director of AWARE, and she was there through the thick of it all. And she is a seasoned uh, activist, as is uh, Remy. Don't let his... Uh, young looks fool you. He has been an activist since you were 15 years old. A <laughs> I think in some circles, uh, being a nuisance is uh, is a praise, right? So, so thank you so much. And I also wanted to say, I brought this book, and not because we're advertising it, is, but all three of us have a chapter in this book. And uh, I think that's where I really wanted to start. Not Not the book itself, but the book represents a lot of what we discussed. Even at the book launch, there were heated discussions right, about what should be the nature of advocacy in Singapore, what's the relationship between us and the state. So I wanted to ask uh, first Corinna and then Remy, so 15 years on, how has civil society evolved from that? And you know, at that time, the state took a hands-off approach, mm. right? Uh, do we see the government doing that today? Like if Saga happened today? so. Yeah. And what does that tell us about the evolution of civil society and the state? Yeah. So I think uh, what was really interesting about Saga is that it happened at a time when smartphones and the internet sort of uh, came into uh, civil society where we actually... And it was like the first campaign, right? And it was not even a planned campaign. It was something that came upon us and we were responding. Uh, but it was really like it was just at that cusp. So um, it was pioneering in that sense. Uh, it, so actually we were now, because uh, the organization had been taken over. So the group that was left, right, the old guard, were no longer an organization. We were now a informal collective trying to fight back. We had a mission. And so it was the, the first sort of very substantive movement uh, as a not a established group anymore and trying to get support from people, from the public, through the internet. So we set up our own website, we are aware, we use Twitter, we use Facebook, um, it's before Instagram, before TikTok, right? So it was kind of a, experimental in that way. So it's quite cool and we can see that. It, so I think that was a turning point. It was the start of something that today is quite commonplace. Mm. But at that point, it was not. Mm. And so we have seen now, uh, that was the starting point, and we can see the evolution, which is that now a lot of uh, civil society groups are not registered. They are not right. established groups. Uh, you don't have the burden of administration, of governance, uh, of course, it's a, the, the nature of the group is very different and we don't know whether you know the groups will last a few years. Aware is celebrating its 40th anniversary. You need a certain infrastructure. With that infrastructure comes the burden of running the group, comes you know that you need funds and it has a lot of implications. And I think we're going to talk about independence later, but it has a lot of implications, right? But the point is that I think now a lot of uh, civil society is informal, is online, is nimble. They get together, uh, an issue happens, you can immediately mobilize, right? which was the what we did. Where it was taken over, we immediately mobilized because of the technology that was there. We could do it, and you know, six weeks later, we got the organization back. All right. Okay. 
Okay, that's very interesting. I wanted to because you you mentioned that you are the, these organizations are not encumbered by the burdens of administration, but there will be some advantages that they do not have access to. I presume as well, right? With, yeah. With the organizational stuff. But yeah. So, Remy, what what about you? Do you think uh, the government would have been hands as hands off today? Um. Well. I I think in the first place, uh, the way um, information about the event would be transmitted would be completely different, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so I was at the Where EGM uh, as uh, the online citizen. So the online citizen is an independent media platform. I started in my first year of law school in 2006. Uh, by the time the AWARE EGM was going on, I think we were one of the more established uh, independent media uh, platforms and uh, the mainstream media wasn't able to get into the EGM hall. Uh, we managed to uh, and we were running Helter Skelter, uh, taking photos uh, and uh, live blogging the event. Uh, so now the concept of live blogging so it, it, it was just reporting what was going on in these bite-sized snippets on our website right uh because we didn't have instagram live right, right? uh we did have uh, tiktok right uh that kind of immediacy uh was still uh not there and a lot of information was still uh a platform based but information now is completely disaggregated it's completely uh, 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 almost deorganizationalized. It's very personalized. It's very individualized, uh, and I think that also informs the way, as Karina said, civil society organizes, right? Uh, and correspondingly, what individuals need uh, to share their views and opinions uh, about what's going on in the world. Uh, so again, just. Another parallel to uh, uh, something I participated in as a so-called student activist, uh, an issue uh, that was current when I was in school was the Saffron Revolution. Uh, this was Burmese monks rising up against the junta and getting very brutally suppressed. And uh, that at the time was one of the key issues of uh, the era. There were uh, hundreds of people actually camped outside the Myanmar embassy. Uh, there was an ASEAN regional forum that was going on at the Shangri-La Hotel. Uh, there was civil society, organizational civil society, uh, apparently in ascendance with uh, Dr. Chi and JBJ doing the uh, Open Singapore Centre, with Think Centre still very active. Uh, I think with Marwa uh, at that time, it's infancy. Uh, and student groups got together uh, across three campuses, uh, and I organized at NUS uh, Faculty of Law uh, to collect petitions, to distribute red armbands, uh, to try and hold the candlelight vigil. Uh, we were told it was a public security problem, got a call from the police, so we had to do it indoors. Uh, mm. We tried to do it indoors, but they said because there's a fire and safety issue, you can't use candles, <laughs> so you have to use light sticks. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did our best, and uh, that was one of the, I guess, foreign policy issues of the time. But you see the way the reactions uh, in society now to Gaza are, it's, it's on a completely different scale. It's a completely different scale. Now, if you ask anyone, do you remember university students mm -hmm. of protest at the time of the Saffron Revolution? Uh, the number question, one, one question you might get is what was the Saffron yeah, Revolution? Right, right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. So, so we will discuss that later on. So thank you. That's, that's really useful. And one of the questions that, that was asked at the book launch, um, and one question that civil society always asks itself, right, internally, I mean, maybe publicly they will deny this, but they will always ask themselves internally, we ask ourselves, what is the relationship we should have with the state? Right? And uh, I think our first call, uh, Corina asked me, so Wally, you've, you've said that AWARE has been co-opted, right? <laughs> Several <laughs> people told me this. <laughs> have to get on the show <laughs> so she said yeah so she was calling me out for it so and and i was because i i mentioned this in my interview with connie and uh also with prashan and i mentioned that i think over the years aware and ping dot have have become co have become more cooperative with the state um what, what what do you think is that first of all is that true or secondly 
what's wrong with it, even if an organization... Okay, so there are two parts to this. Uh, firstly, that the government has changed. And actually for me, it was quite distinct because I had been a activist before 2011. And to me, that is actually a marker, quite a distinct mm. mark when the state changed. And the change was that they became more cooperative with civil society. Right. Right? So people say, oh, you've become more cooperative with the state. Actually, we always want to influence the state. If we are just out there and we are not able to get into the policymakers' uh, view and to actually speak to them, try to influence them, you know, both uh, media is, no, is always there, but actually you, the, the meetings with them is important. We want them to actually pay attention to our research. But in the past, it was not possible. You couldn't just sort of get a meeting. So 2011 uh, was the election where I think PAP just got 60% of the votes uh, as opposed to 67% the year before. So they're like, okay, they did a lot of soul searching. And one of the things that they felt was we are kind of out of touch. So then who do, should they get in touch with? Um, and at that point, the answer seemed to be, let's at least speak to established groups. Right? So actually there was that opening and that changed the way we did things as well. So now, and there are pros and cons to this. If we have a piece of research, we will make sure that they do actually read it and they see it and they pay attention to it, they go through it and that they consider the arguments. We also now are able to get meetings with all the relevant parties and then uh, to make a case, right, based on the research and to keep doing this. So, um, the con of that, though, is that because you are now in touch with them, you also need to have a bit more respect mm. and say, okay, before we launch to the public, here's an advanced copy. If there's anything that you see that is inaccurate, you let us know, we will consider it. We will still exercise the independence, right? So in that sense, I don't think we are co-opted. We have our mission, we have the policies we want to change, we have our recommendations, we stay with that. and at, But we know at least the state is paying attention. But there's a game that is played, which is that we give you an advanced copy first. Uh, if we don't agree with what you say, we will put footnote, uh, states at this, but it's still our position in the body, right? But do, there's that reflection. The critics of the state from away uh, become a bit softer or milder because of this personal relationship and also it's human nature right once we know each other it's more difficult to be hard hitting and so on do you, do you think that? Uh, you have much more of a dialogue that's going on right they will tell you things that they might not have told you mm. sometimes a, a position that they take in public it's a position that they can publicly take, but it's not the real reason. Right. If you can understand the real reason, you, you can, can then now try to address that. Right. Right. Uh, so you get more information. There are pros and cons. Right? right. So it does. It might come across as we are a little softer, but that's why we need a whole range of groups as well, because mm. we need you know good cop, bad cop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's that sort of <laughs> thing that is right. quite helpful. Right. Right. right, right. Uh, so yeah, we're 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 now more of not a good cop, but still we are someone that's <laughs> like that bridge. Like, okay, you can tell us what's happening, and of course we are cooperating. Right. We hope, right, as much as possible with the other people that are are, are pushing for the same thing. Maybe more independent because they're not registered. Uh, they don't have a whole legacy, and you know, like a, a big team to try to support, uh, pay salaries off, but. We try to be collaborative. And one thing we can do as we, we think of ourselves more as big sister, we do try to support the smaller emergent groups that are speaking up, mm. that are doing things that are niche, which we ourselves might not be able to do, but we actually give them technical and financial support. Okay, thank you. So maybe for the back cop now. I like that. <laughs> um, so, so I think I think there's an important distinction to be made 
uh, when we say mainstream civil society, right? Uh, I think what we actually speak of is a distinction between organizational civil society uh, and civil society as it refers to individuals and more loosely uh, organized collectives of individuals pushing particular causes. Uh, so to uh, achieve particular objectives, I think in more medium and long-term situations, um, uh, you need organizations and institutions uh, that are able to have and maintain that dialogue with the state uh, with uh, a, a goal to uh, at times collaborating with, at times critiquing or criticizing the state um, if you do want to work on long-term legislative change, right? Uh, so I think <clears throat> migrant workers groups uh, uh, getting uh, MOM to uh, at some point agree to a day off for me if the domestic workers. Uh, that was a process of negotiating uh, when you arm twist and when you collaborate, when you uh, convince and when you criticize. Uh, same thing with aware and marital rape immunity. Uh, that's something that takes a lot of time and actually specialized expertise and resources. Uh, uh, to get to a yes on, uh, as was, I think, the repeal of 377A. Mm. Uh, so it takes two hands to clap. Uh, a one-handed clap is a slap. <laughs> uh, but as we've seen in political discourse, sometimes your co-driver, if the driver is going off the road, needs to slap <laughs> the driver to wake him up. Uh, and so there are going to be those times uh, which requires some, I think, uh, more acerbic uh, advocacy, uh, where individuals or more loosely coordinated collectives uh, raise their voices uh, in a disaggregated but spontaneous manner uh, to say that uh, there are uh, issues of particular concern that are topical uh, that the government needs to pay attention to, right? Uh, and that kind of ecosystem is healthy, right? right. Uh, because when uh, uh, individuals or collectives that might be more radical than uh, those in the mainstream organizations get in trouble, uh, uh, those with credibility in the middle uh, can convince the policymakers that they're dialoguing with uh, to give a bit more space, right? right? Uh, and at the same time, uh, there is uh, the possibility that uh, uh, you have to play a bad cop so that good cop sometimes yeah. can can get more things done. Yeah, right. Because then uh, the message to uh, the government is, hey, uh, help us help you. Yeah, right. Uh, we want to move the ball forward, yeah. and if there's going to be no movement in the middle ground, uh, then the fringe could take over. So, so I definitely agree. I think with uh, the two of you, the, the overarching philosophy is that we need an ecosystem and there are some... I mean, I always want to have engagement with the state. Right? I always want them to hear my my views. At the same time, I do think that... I mean, I don't want to be a radical, <laughs> but I appreciate the fact that there are some people yes. because then... I mean, being radical or moderate is all relative. Without the ra radical, the moderates would be the extreme, right? So... I, I think that we need that ecosystem, right? So, so thank you. That was a comprehensive answer. And you mentioned repeal, uh, Remy, and is was repeal, um, was that a vindication of the incremental change approach in civil society? Or because if you look at maybe activism as any snapshot in time, then it's difficult to see change, mm. right? And mm. it's, it's, it's easy to get discouraged. But if you look at it over... Five ten year period, then you see. Oh, actually, there's been substantive movement. Um, well, if if you look at the work that was done in the community organisations like Ping Dot, uh, then that was a process of uh, getting the government, getting the people uh, uh, to where we are now. They also worked in collaboration with uh, strategies that I think when we at least I started using them at the beginning, uh, would have been considered radical. Uh, for instance, the lawsuits that I took up 
uh, to challenge the constitutionality of 377A. The first one we did was in 2013. Uh, and at that time, it was uh, hugely controversial, even in the community, about whether or not taking uh, right. that kind of binary uh, approach was the best one to take. Mm. Uh, and then again in 2018, when we decided, look, let's try again. right? Uh, and uh, a lot of people we spoke to were, were concerned. They said, well, uh, if you do a lawsuit, it's an all or nothing. Right, uh, you win or you lose, and if you lose, maybe you lose for a generation, which is what we thought had happened in 2015 when the Court of Appeal turned back uh, the 377A um, uh, appeal. Uh, and then over a period of years, you see, uh, and now in hindsight, we look back, and uh, I think PM said as much in his National Day rally speech. Uh, part of the reason they repealed was because of the repeated challenges right. to the law, uh, uh, and. Uh, of course, while rhetorically that's what was said, uh, we all know that, and, and the statistics have, have shown, uh, the ground has shifted over that years. And that shift didn't happen just because of the lawsuits, oh. right? It happened because of a process of uh, Ping Dot and the community groups doing the heavy lifting on the ground. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, ultimately, it was a political slash electoral decision mm. right as and and we want politicians to react to ground sentiment mm. so that's not uh, that's not a bad thing i think that's that's a good thing if politicians react that way so uh, uh and this this question is for the two of you and for, for corinna i mean we will start with corinna so what why was saga uh, so disturbing right? why was it so disturbing is there the broader question i wanted to ask is there a liberal bias in civil society right so why can't conservatives take over away like why if that's what um women want like, <laughs> like it wasn't become, right right so, so, so it was disturbing because it was a group that had a very different intention that had like a secret agenda right. uh taking over making use of legal provisions uh and we intentionally had a very very loose constitution where you could join and on that day on the spot, you could be on a board, and if there were enough of you, you could actually take over. It was intentional because we didn't want to have so many barriers right. to stop people from getting onto the board, because we would. It's hard to get people to go onto the board. Yeah. Um, so uh, they didn't do it illegally, but the intentions were uh, not transparent. And if they had said, "Oh, we're actually coming here because we don't like your sex ed program," and so, I don't think they would have gotten. In. They wouldn't have won, yeah. yeah, so there were this like sub, sub, subterfuge, right? right? Uh, that was wrong, okay. and it was also motivated by uh, sort of there were religious motivations, mm. right? Um, and it was from one particular church, so I think it was really an obvious case of this goes against our Singapore culture of multiculturalism. Uh, aware was really supportive of all, you know, of inclusion of LGBTQ plus, and they had an anti-LGBTQ plus agenda, right? So that too was wrong, right? Yeah. So, 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 so the yeah. wider question then is: Is there a liberal bias in civil society? It seems like from your answer, when you say a... by a liberal bias, I consider them part of civil society, right? The conservatives, as yes. Well. Okay. And uh, is there a liberal so? You know, you know, there's a movement called Love Singapore. It's got hundreds of thousands of people. If you measure by numbers, they would actually uh, far exceed uh, the civil society groups and probably the liberal groups because it's church. Mm. It's a lot of numbers, right? right? Uh, and that particular group is anti-LGBT. It's not just a group of churches. They, it's churches with a certain agenda. Right. I do consider them to be civil society. Uh, to me, it's it, it, what was special about Saga was for the first time we saw this polarization right. take place transparently and the groups faced off, right? Mm. right? Which you don't see, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. generally yeah. speaking. Mm. And but we managed to resolve it right. peacefully. Right. They said we were a bit rowdy, but you know, we didn't have, <laughs> within the law, it was peaceful, yeah, it yeah, was peaceful yeah, 
right? And so uh, that was quite special, and a yeah. building that actually you've seen a repeat of. That. Right, and we, as in you, you resolved it, and this is an issue which is almost it's difficult to find a common ground, or almost impossible, right? But it was resolved without state intervention. Right? I think that's. Yeah, so that's, there was a little subtle important. state intervention <laughs> uh, because they said something about the pastor using the pulpit. Right, right. But it was actually without state intervention. Right. No one called us. We're like, oh, is someone going to call us? And you asked the question earlier, would it be different if it happened today? And that's kind of interesting because I think it might have been. And, not, and like I said, it's because the state has become friendlier to the groups on these issues especially. Mm. When they change 377A, all this consultation with the interface, the, 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 those groups, and then with the LGBT groups, there was a long period of consultation on both sides. Which I think a lot of the members of public are not privy to, right? As in the state really laid the groundwork for, for that for yeah, a couple I guess, of years. Uh, yeah, I mean, for us, it was common knowledge, but yeah. I guess a lot yeah, of yeah. members of the public may not have yeah. been uh, uh, privy to that, right? Mm. But there was a lot of consultation. Right, so the state has changed its relationship with civil society. There's still a lot of wariness. And of course, there are actually more laws to try to control and contain. I think that's a response to the fact that uh, anyone can be an activist today. The channels are there. So in a sense, they have less control than they used to have. Right. And so then they've put in more laws. Right. Uh, on balance, I don't know whether we have more or less freedom of speech. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but there are certainly more laws today, right? Mm. Tofma, FICA, they were things that we did try to speak up against. Uh, we, when Tofma came out, we we're like, okay, as, this one very worrying because, gosh, what does it mean? And they're pretty broadly drafted. We did get civil society groups. Remy, we, we, we got Remy's, and he volunteered and says, okay, this is what the law is. These are the implications for you. These are the areas that you should be speaking up on. So we, we did try to do that. Didn't get very far, but you know, we put all of these questions and issues and concerns to the state, um, and then they didn't engage us privately to answer, but they answered some of them in parliament. Right. So one of the things, I mean, I, I've asked you before also. One of the criticisms that people, I mean, at my my talk uh, with Kokho, one of the things that uh, people mentioned was that. Organizations like Aware, not only Aware, but organizations like Aware and Pink Dot, they have made a lot of movements and wins. They've gotten a lot of wins mm -hmm. in the area of social uh, liberties, but not civil liberties. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, is that is that the surprise you pay for for getting those wins? Like, I I am pretty sure that the marital rape immunity would not have happened if Aware didn't have that sort of relationship with. Uh, with the government, right? So that's a that's a huge win, and that only happened in the past like, four or five years. Um, but uh, that one, I don't think was relationship with you government. Don't think so? No, okay. there were there were some things that we have, but the fact that there's a group that keeps talking about this and it looks a bit silly for Singapore right, want right, to be right. a modern society, right. uh, you know, good standing in the right. world. And we, the government did sign CEDAW, right, right? Yes. convention on to eliminate all forms of discrimination against women. Uh, in two weeks' time, I go up to Geneva. There's a there's a, a shadow report uh, section by all the NGOs, and we we are on in on the international platform saying hey, these are the areas right. that really need to be changed. Right? Yeah. There's just no reason yeah. that this is the current right. policy. So it's things it's like that. Those fruit yeah for the government. Right. right? Yeah. So actually, that one we pushed. Right. There right. was no this one. There was no discussion. Right. right. Okay. No, but, but there were some others that we we were working a little bit more right. closely. Like. Uh, harassment, right? right? So, so some laws, yes, and some were just front door only, no back door discussion. Right, right. So is that is that the price we pay for? <laughs> like, so we we do not like. Uh, I mean, there there is like like you mentioned on there are new laws like and especially in the past few years, POFMA, FICA, but more POFMA than FICA, I suppose. Yeah. Right? FICA hasn't really been used against uh, civil society. Yeah. Uh, so. I guess because we have more doors, right? Right. So in that sense, and bec and also the state has this thing about uh, we are a women's rights, gender equality group. That is the main mission, right? The civil liberties is important, 
generally speaking, it's also important to our work. If we didn't have the liberty to speak up and, and talk about these things, it, we, we would really feel uh, quite paralyzed. But um, it's not the main mission. And the sad thing is that there are very few like more human rights, civil, li civil liberties group uh, around in Singapore anymore. And in the past, there were more. Mm. Right? We had more mm. like Marwa, you know, was stronger. Mm. But then they, mm. their wings have been clipped because of some of the laws that say you are gazetted as a political association. Right? So, so they've done, the state has, has I feel, uh, sadly, actually uh, clipped the wings of the human rights, civil mm. liberties groups. We have always been about social rights. Right, right. right? So to say, oh, you got to also make the other thing your work is is a little bit like, Understood. yeah, not so realistic. Understood. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so I, I'll just take a step back from the question about whether or not civil society has a liberal bias, right? Uh, and I'll start from the premise of what I uh, consider the role of civil, civil, society, civil society to be. Uh, the role of civil society, as I see it, organizations and individuals participating in uh, working for a better future for Singapore that is not part of the uh, hegemonic narrative, that's not part of the government uh, agenda, right? It's independent uh, of the government and sometimes acts uh, around or in opposition to the government. Uh, so that's how I understand and see uh, uh, the function of civil society. Uh, Singapore, I think, is widely recognized, our government is widely recognized as an illiberal one. Uh, and therefore, I think in opposition to that, <laughs> it's easy uh, on surface to see that opposition or that working around necessarily as liberal right. uh, in terms of uh, civil liberties and modality, right? What uh, civil space there is. Right. But if you ask yourself what kind of policies uh, the government actually pushes, many in civil society would consider uh, the social policy of government, uh, in particular areas, uncomfortably progressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, therefore, in opposition to that or working around that, uh, you see very active civil society groups that would identify as socially conservative. Right. And I'm not being facetious, you look at the petition collections in 2007. So we did a repeal 377A petition. There was a keep 377A petition. Uh, interestingly, at the time I was doing repeal 377A, I was an editor of the Online Citizen. My co-editor of the Online Citizen was Gerald Giam, uh, who had started the keep 377A oh. petition. Yeah. Uh, which I think, again, is an interesting yeah, yeah. Uh, and important lesson on how to disagree yeah. in a constructive and informed yeah. way, uh, right? Uh, and That's his petition, friends, right? really good. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I respect, Jared's one of the people I respect great, most yeah. in politics these days. Um, and uh, the key reasons of the petition got a lot more signatures. Again, fast forward to 2018, after the Indian Supreme Court decision, uh, when we started ready for repeal, uh, we went around collecting signatures, but uh, the key 377 petition in 2018, I think got nearly 10 times more signatures than wow. the repeal petition. Uh, and if you look at the organization uh, of the key 377A movement just on the cusp of repeal in August 2022, uh, uh, Protect Singapore managed to mobilize 1,200 people uh, for a town hall in support of retaining 377A. And if you go even further back uh, to the decision to introduce casinos in Singapore, you saw a mass mobilization of what we would say are social conservatives uh, in opposition to that government decision. Uh, so to answer your question, I, I don't think civil society is a liberal bias. The civil society I inhabit most certainly does, right? I mean, <laughs> right on the little bottle. Wait, that's a little bottle. Yeah, yeah. And you just have the probably just have the misfortune to interact more with with us. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not biased. Right, right. No, so so that's really useful, and also I think it's quite heartening. You said uh, that 
you started that and Gerald started that and you guys are still <laughs> friends. And I think that's that's such an important lesson that we should we should take as yeah. a society. You know, I mean, there will be all these yeah. deep ideological uh, divisions that, but it shouldn't. I mean, to the best of our abilities, it shouldn't affect personal relationships and the social fabric. I think so, that's uh, yeah. one of the things that also I worry about, which is even in the liberal part of civil society, sometimes we see, we draw even more lines. Yeah. Yeah. You are not, uh, yeah. you're, too, you're too conservative, yeah. even though, you know, you should be speaking up more on certain yeah. things, right? And like, okay, so we're not going to support your cause. I'm like, I, I really think that's a, not a healthy sort of way to build a strong civil society. We have to, I think, try to work with everyone, embrace everyone, respect also the different views and where we can collaborate we collaborate right. Right? right rather than say okay you're just not yeah uh, liberal enough yeah i do find that this is more prevalent on the left on on the liberal <laughs> side this what i would call the narcissism of small differences right <laughs> just if you are slightly different slightly to the left slightly to the right of the people on the left then somehow there's a tendency to say, oh, you are not pure enough, <laughs> like, something like that. I do find this to be more of a tendency on, I mean, just also on, from my personal experience, uh, recently we had the Gaza monologues and there was a call, it was a minority, but it was, I guess, loud enough, a call for people to boycott the event because we were, uh, in the words of somebody who DM me, collaborating with the oppressor. Uh, because we were we had uh, the government on board, and my response was, "It's not the the government isn't the one oppressing the Palestinians." Yeah, and also, wouldn't you want the government to be there to hear what people are gonna say? That was my approach. But I also appreciate the fact that these people keep keep us honest, right? But to call for boycott, I mean, that's that's where I think. That, I mean, just just basically what what you are saying. I don't know how helpful that is in this. Yeah, we're on the same side. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Exactly. And there are yeah, different exactly. strategies. Yes, yes, yes. And yeah. I think more dialogue is better yeah. uh, so that we can understand the strategies and we can also see whether, you know, we can coordinate more right? Uh, rather than less. Right. Yeah. So I do appreciate it and like all dialogue with government as well as di di dialogue with more oppositional groups. Right. I think that is really helpful. Yeah. So do you actively for instance have these dialogues with more conservative groups with the conservative yes. groups not so okay with government yes mm. with uh, the liberal side yes but could do more you know in the past we had something called APA E2 activists yes and which was uh, a aware's attempt to bring civil society together I think past COVID we, we stopped thinking about that because a lot of other issues that we're dealing with including running the services and the burnout of staff. And so it's been sort of uh, quite challenging internally. Um, but we've always tried to be like, okay, how, how do we in our own way contribute to the building of civil society? We may not be able to do much about the changes of law. And you know, actually the change in law, it, POFMA and all that, you can make noise, but you know it's a done deal. Right. By the time they introduce it, the first reading, it's already done. There's, you can only say clarification in Parliament and, and try to push a little bit, but actually it's really difficult. Mm, yeah. Okay. Uh, but in our own way, uh, we, we have tried, uh, I think, three versions of APA E2, three episodes of uh, APA E2 activists, bringing together different groups to share their tactics, their strategies, the common areas that they work on, etc. I think things like that uh, are great. It's just that for us to have to keep doing it was a little bit too much. And I think uh, in the last two ed editions, keep Yale and US, and right. very sad that there's no more no more Yale and US, but they were our partners. Right. right? And I know a lot of people who, who love that whole series. Right. And I mean, speaking of which, uh, Academia SG, another liberal organization, <laughs> 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 is going to have their conference on civil yes. society. And said, you are... Speaking right? Yes. Uh, will you be there? No. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I saw quite a uh, quite a diverse range of yes, uh, things like that. Right. Yes, yes. So that's that's almost like the upper two activists. Yes. Yeah. Maybe exactly. with a more academic slant. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So 
Uh, thank you, uh, Remy, for bringing up the Saffron Revolution as well, because I, I mean, I, I believe you're about the same age, and I, I don't really remember that episode. That whole series of incidents too well. Not not the Saffron Revolution, but the uh, Singaporeans' response to it or undergrads' response to it. So, uh, you know, just as Saga was an important moment in civil society history, I feel like what we are going through now, without trying to be presentist about it, like mm. with, with Gaza and Palestine, I feel that this potentially could be, when we look back four or five years from now, that... This was a clarifying moment. This was an important moment in Singapore civil society. Because what has happened is young people or even older people are just... Because now the definition of an activist has changed. Like yeah. Everyone is a potential activist. So they are making so much noise. Are, there's an outpouring of emotions and hurt uh, on, on Gaza and Palestine. And the mainstream civil society organizations have not really taken the lead or... I have not really get, gotten involved in this as well. So, so my question is, well, it's two parts. So one is, why is that the case? Why is mainstream uh, civil society, like AWARE or other organizations, hesitant to, to speak on this or take the lead on this? And the other is, do you think this is, based on your years and years of experience in civil society, this is another one of those defining moments where, uh, I mean, I've, I've never remembered on this scale, at least, Singaporeans criticise the government on foreign policy. Like much of the criticisms towards the PAP usually would be on domestic policy. <clears throat> so it, it seems to me like younger Singaporeans, this is their first foray into foreign policy. Well, yeah, uh, it, it is an inflection point, not just in Singaporean history, but also world history. Right? Uh, for the first time, uh, you see the International Court of Justice uh, it imposed provisional measures in relation to what it says is plausible evidence of genocide. My personal belief is uh, genocide is happening. It's happening. Uh, and it's serious enough for the ICJ to say it's plausible. Uh, it says it in relation to the scale of the death and destruction. It says it in relation to the humanitarian crisis. It says it with reference to specific statements by Israeli senior Israeli politicians. And it says it with reference to, at one count, 37 concerns expressed by 37 independent experts and rapporteurs uh, of the United Nations. Right? So it, it is a turning point in world history. Uh, and uh, how we respond uh, and how people have responded, I think, is, is indicative of the seriousness of the moment, right? Uh, can we do more? Yes. I, I think more can and should be done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, I'll take the, I don't know about other mainstream organizations. I can share uh, how we've been looking at it. Uh, so... Firstly, when it first started, uh, it was not clear what was happening, right? I mean, it's like there was terrorism, but there was also then this response, which was so, it's now become so clear, like, you know, it's so disproportionate, it's genocide, right? Uh, and as a civil society organization that has already been warned about religious issues, with a sort of a hint of if you continue on a you know with a particular issue we were looking at, uh, there may be consequences, mm. right? Um, is this does that mean we are not independent? No, but we there are OB markers, and one of the things about the relationship between state and the more established groups is they can tell you you're getting very close to the OB marker. Now, this doesn't happen very often, so I will not, you know, this is, it was kind of rare, but it was in relation to religious issues, right? Uh, so that is already at the back of our minds. If, if it's not clear and if we can't really add value and if it's not clearly a gender issue, a women's rights issue for Singapore, and note we do have an uh, institution of public character status, which means that our work must be about Singapore, then we will have to really weigh all of these considerations and say, how can we add value here? 
is it and is it our place as well right how how do we try to to support this terrible thing that's happening in the world uh so as an organization now we are in the process of organizing a documentary and a talk uh by people who are much closer to what's happening there so that we can learn uh as a group and also to to really more as education and for us all to think about and learn more about what can we do right if you say do more do what because we are here and you know it is there and so what can we actually do plus there are all these rules and i think the government has been like we hear from our friends they got called up you know and maybe it's a police investigation probably it won't lead anywhere but the fact that the police are stepping in to actually speak to individuals this this is an indication that there's a lot of nervousness about this um i also feel like you know people people have to have a way of expressing their concern uh and the fact that they care so much about this is a really good sign for the world yeah. and for singapore right is it going to be a turning point i think any any um active engagement in civil society and where you can feel i am not alone will change a person i think that saga changed people and they felt like mm. yeah you know we can do something mm. we're not powerless mm. people told us uh don't fight because it's the church and you don't have enough uh, people and it's a numbers game but we fought and and that changed us all as individuals who were part of that and we felt this was unjust this was wrong we have to even if we lose we have to go down fighting and that will change people and i think that this might actually have that effect right it's hard to say where you know yeah. e- exactly what the uh, outcome will be but in this way it is exciting for civil society that we see this happening that right. there's all of this energy and by people who don't usually get involved exactly. in these things who previously have never really been involved yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so thank you and I think I think that's a really hopeful way of interpreting uh, what what is happening and as someone who has looked at this episode as this this particular conflict for a very long time and I as I uh, going back to what I said if you look at it at any snapshot in time is difficult to see change but for sure this time round the government has really reacted to ground sentiment shifting like the airdrop is of food is something I never thought was even possible right? and right uh Vivian, Dr. Vivian saying to Netanyahu to his face that you've gone too far. Minister Shanmugam taking the Israeli embassy to task. These are not insignificant, I think. And I think hopefully when people see, oh, you know, the government, the government's uh, positions on this, I think have been pretty reasonable this time. I know they have reacted uh, to what people uh, people have said. And then uh, on the part of activists and organizations, right, whatever we do in Singapore is not really going to affect the outcome in Palestine right so it's not really about affecting the uh, outcome in Palestine in fact i think the battle is not even won in Palestine the battle is won in America right that's where public sentiment if that shifts then that that changes everything but it's about stating our stand right it's about showing what we stand for and i i was talking to some uh, some leaders of organizations my worry is that after this episode if the organizations do not take stances then it's very difficult for organizations to have like serious moral credibility after this because on something that is so important and is so blatant if you are hesitant so it's not about changing the outcome but it's about us being true to our own sense of self well like, I, what, I, yeah. you know while i i wouldn't discount the power of people to change government's direction in thinking and consequently the power of a single government with other governments to get a ball right. rolling towards a substantive outcome even okay? a small government no, even like a small government Singapore, like ours, yes, yes even yes, a small yes, and, right. and I'll share with you from from what I saw in 2008 during the Saffron revolution for the first time Uh, the Singapore Foreign Ministry, I think it was George Yeo, expressed revulsion at the actions of the junta in suppressing the Saffron Revolution. 
And Singapore was the chair of ASEAN. The ASEAN Foreign, Foreign Ministers meeting was held in, in the Shangri-La. Uh, and Singapore, prior to the Saffron Revolution, had a very non-interventionist, right. uh, just get along uh, approach to the junta. And after the Saffron Revolution, it took a markedly sharper tone. And you could see, uh, I think after that, the foreign ministry get uh, a, a lot more serious with the junta. Uh, and in some ways, I think uh, the firming up of the position of ASEAN uh, led eventually to the change in uh, position that brought Aung San Suu Kyi into government. Of course, we, we are where we are now. Mm. Uh, and it's going to be a long process before uh, the coup is unwound. Right. Uh, but uh, again, uh, I don't think we should accept as a starting point if we want to be engaged of these with, with these great issues of the day that we're powerless to change things. I, 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 think, I think that we have much more power than we realize. Yeah. I accept that criticism and I revise my stand. No, no, you're right. You're right. No, you're right. I think I think that's the way we should be looking at things. So thank you. And just just uh, we we zoom out again, right? So, uh, what what you said earlier, you know, there are police investigations, and even though I think I I am largely on board with the government's approach uh, so far on this issue, um, I think the police investigations were unnecessary, especially on the influencers, you know. I mean, I thought like these two, they were just sharing stuff online. Okay, so I understand that the march to Istana is a different one. I'm talking about the influencers. I, uh, so things like that, do you think it has an effect on people? Like, especially people now, some people are saying, hey, how do you, how do you post these things? I mean, I, I don't know what I can get away with. Just because the OB markers, and they are OB markers, but they are ambiguous. We don't know where they are. So if they are there, right? And people just operate here, and there's this whole space that the Remis of the world, the Koreanos of the world operate, but most people just just stay there. Do you think those things are not useful for civil society in the long run? And it has the effect of actually, because if we just operate here, eventually the boundaries will come further in. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think the uh, like the police investigations, some of them like hmm, not sure. Uh, you, you just hear a lot of people whispering about it. Um, but aside from police, I think uh, there is a fear in Singapore about taking a stand on anything. Mm. And so I had uh, you know, I'm interviewing for positions, and and I'm like, oh, okay, this person, I'm I'm trying to get to know better. And I, I go to that and I'm like, okay, you know, show me your, you know, social media pages. And because this person, because it's, com, it's a comms role uh, related to comms. So I said, just see your comms. And she's like, oh, uh, don't take it against me. I have something on Gaza. And I'm like, no, this is not bad at all. This is good. <laughs> you have stand, right? right? This is, uh, right. it's not a bad thing for us. It's not a bad thing. Maybe for you know, another employer, it right. might be, right? But I could see the fear, right? Even as they express, this is like, oh, I don't put it on my LinkedIn. I put it on my Insta, right? So um, I think that's generally a lot of fear of like taking a political stand. Um, and maybe this is what uh, this Gaza incident, if more people do it, right? Just express what they feel um, in a peaceful way. I think it would be... it. It would empower civil society. We need to, I, I think, try it. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, even if it's a little scary. Um, on your earlier question about uh, credibility mm. and, you know, right, they don't right. take a stand. Yeah. I think that every organization has to really, like I say, weigh and balance it. Is there, is it firstly something that uh, is their mission? Uh, even if it's not their mission, should they still be saying something about it? Um, is there? I think that is some. It's something that we are thinking uh, about very seriously. How do we? Um, what should our a public position be? And you know, it's 
it's also that there are many other conflicts in the world. This one for, for and and I think it's the scale of it, uh, and it does seem like it's genocide because of the scale of it. But we we generally don't speak up. Like Myanmar happened, we didn't speak up. But of course, all of these conflicts, it's a feminist issue because women are going to be women and children are the most vulnerable. The men may be more involved in the combat, right. but women and children are the most vulnerable. And this is true of all conflict. Uh, and we would love to end, try to end all violence in Singapore and in the world. Um, but we can't take a stand on every single thing, right? So, so we need to find a, a principled approach to this. Mm. What do we take a stand on, what we don't? And, and I think every case is going to be a case by case. Okay. But Thank you. Yeah, I think it's important to really think about it. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. Um. I, I as a lawyer, uh, as an activist, uh, I've been sad and disappointed with what I perceive as the uh, narrowing space for political discourse, uh, especially when it comes to legislation. Uh, but the one thing that gives me comfort is uh, my preoccupations are quite, in a sense, an elitist pre preoccupation because I look at this legislation, I study it, and I know how bad it is, right? Uh, but, uh, and, and in an earlier era, uh, before TikTok, before IG Live, uh, people used to read something called a newspaper, and people used to read something called the opinion pages of a newspaper. And people in society would uh, hew to particular points of view because of what great people in society said or thought. Uh, that's just not the way information works anymore. Right? I, I, I mean, the number of people listening to us have this very informed and substantive dis discussion is a drop in the ocean compared to the virality of... Uh, direct to camera videos of influencers half my age, yeah. half my age, uh, who speak up on Palestine uh, with so much more passion yeah. than, 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 you know, yeah. the intellectuals who sit and think and dissect, yeah. right? Uh, and the kind of viewership they get, and they don't sit there asking themselves, oh, what are speech laws, what are permissible, what's not permissible. This is something that I concern myself with day in, day out. These are things that I uh, do when I advise people after they've been arrested or after the police have gone to them to speak about these things, uh, because they, they've been speaking about these things. But actually, the vast majority of people that speak on these issues don't, don't care. But they don't care. Uh, so even as the civil and political space, in my view, has shrunk, uh, legislatively speaking, uh, I think culturally, uh, the conscientization of Singaporean society is at a very different place from, from where it was when, when Saga began. It's, 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 it's something that I, I'm constantly coming to terms with and constantly trying to understand. So both things are happening yeah. at once. Ah, so the shrinking ah, of the ah, space, but yes. in a different way, the in space has, op has expanded yeah. in a different way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you see, even for those who fear like us, or those who stop and think about the legislation before speaking, um, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. Because at least those who fear are concerned enough to ask and then decide whether or not and how to act. Uh, they care, right? And then there's a vast majority of people who uh, care uh, about particular issues and don't care or think about or obsess about the legislation, right? Uh, what would be uh, of concern is a state of apathy yeah. <laughs> where people don't fear because yeah. they don't care, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, but you care, you fear, and then you decide what, what risk am I going to take? Yeah. Where am I on the spectrum? Uh, and a lot of people these days, they, they don't worry about the OB markers. The, the way uh, people that grew up in institutional civil society yeah. uh, think about it. Right. Yeah, even the term OB marker. <laughs> that's an anachronism from the 90s, right? Yeah, yeah, from the 90s. 
we should have mentioned out of bounds. <laughs> So actually, that's an, an interesting point because I found that uh, a lot of people didn't know about Saga even though it was in the newspapers mm, okay. a lot. But then the podcast right. has really gone viral, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, because yeah. like, wow, this happened in Singapore yeah. and, you know, culturally, it's like, yeah, it's like, I, so I think if Saga happened today, yeah. we would need a, a hall that was really big, oh, yeah, right? Oh, to, yeah, to have, yeah, 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 it would be massive, right? Yeah, yeah. A, lot, a, a lot more people yeah. would come. But also the yeah. plot was masterfully done in terms of the narrative. Absolutely. Yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. why I think like, it, it really went by the like, high, yes. high quality production, not not like this. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so final question, right? final question. What's next for civil society? Right? So you, the two of you have like at least two, three decades of experience uh, individually in civil society. Where do you see it progressing now? Given... I mean, let's face it, we all operate in a political context, right? So given where Singapore is at now, with the leadership transition, uh, a new prime minister is coming in a couple of weeks. So what what is the state of civil society? Is it more of the same? Or so I'm seeing a few trends. One is more co-option, right? And I hear I mean by actually the setting up by government of certain groups, so they actually go further, not just existing group, but actually they set up their own right. gongos, right? right? Government mm. operated or organized NGOs. So so that's that. And I'm not sure that people will be able to say, oh, this is, a, 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 I call them fake NGOs, <laughs> <laughs> not real NGOs, but they do uh, crowd out space, right? right? Uh, and I think the government has sort of like caught on to like, yeah, we actually uh, would be in government's interest to try to set up uh, organizations that tap on this youth energy, right? But wouldn't people yeah. see through that? Wouldn't it be better just to co-op away instead of setting up... We're not co-optable, I think. <laughs> so no, that's wouldn't why. it be better like, on the government's <laughs> part just to bring you closer instead of setting up their own version of aware? Like, people will see right through that, right? Uh, we hope so. <laughs> Not that they are, you know, we still have a relationship, but it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, it's, a, it's really a, a difficult relationship. It's right, what right. I call a complex relationship, right? Right, right. right? Uh, but, right, right. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think that's not enough. Right. I think that they actually see uh, we must take... Uh, and and we, or, or the other way is that you can see it is that um, we... The fact that they are setting up some things to try to promote more gender equal mindsets and to deal with some of these issues is perhaps a really what we should be patting ourselves on the back right. on, right? right. It's, it's a sign of success right. that is now becoming so mainstream right. that the government is setting it up, right? So uh, perhaps we should welcome it, right? And uh, then we just evolve because there will always be other issues, Space, yeah. right? And what we're seeing now also intersectionality. You don't just do gender, you have to really yeah. do like the intersectional issues, right. right? And so I think the issues have also changed, right? Mental health, LGBTQ+, plus, uh, there are other issues that are coming up. Uh, so that's that's one. Uh, so you things. see more gongos being set up. Uh, <laughs> I see the government really adapting its strategy. Mm. Uh, the you know even the new the rhetoric from Lawrence Wong feels different, right? Mm. About inclusivity and uh, you know we really are there for you. I think they they are really uh, they're, they're shifting in that sense, mm. getting closer to the people. Mm. And there will be, I guess, organizations that up to do this. Uh, government has some things that they are behind, but they, you, you can't, it's, a, it's invisible to the public, right? So they will do more of these things. Some Congos are actually invisible as Congos. Yeah. Yeah, you can't actually right. tell. Right, right, right. That so there then are some... nobody can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I don't know what so, other things So, so just, just yeah. a point on that also, like, uh, just on this Gaza thing since October, like, the government yeah. has had so many closed-door dialogues. Like, mm. I, I think I think at least a dozen, right? And mm. maybe some people would know, some people do not know, so they are actively working the ground. And this is something that they always do for all these issues that, that people may not know, yeah, sometimes. Yeah. 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 No. Um. I think 
as uh, information has become more disaggregated. Uh, one trend I see is what we would conventionally think of as civil society, uh, as civil society organizations, uh, are going to... Um, there's going to be a divergence between uh, organizations uh, and what I call the buzz at the bottom, but what's on the ground, right? Uh, because I think organizational civil society requires um, uh, cooperation. It requires compromise in yeah. some uh, at some parts. It also requires an investment of time and resource, right? Uh, but the reality of how civil society and how opinions and views are shaped uh, in the era we're in is you can have outsized influence for minimal effort, minimal effort. So yeah. we will see, uh, I think, the relevance or the importance of civil society organizations, of all organizations actually, the government or civil society organizations, decrease? really start to decrease, wow. really start to decrease. Because that's just not the way people think and act anymore. No. They don't really think organizationally or institutionally, right? Uh, there will be a role and a place for government and for what we conventionally think of as civil society. But uh, the direction a country takes is going to be a lot more determined by what the buzz at the bottom is, uh, which speaks to Karina's point about uh, the government being more responsive. Because it's realized information has changed. Previously, if you want to find out what the women's uh, rights organizations, what, what, what women are thinking, you go, go to women's yeah. rights organizations and go dialogue, right? But uh, for instance, Monica Bay the, yeah. and the Me Too movement, that was yeah. hugely ground up. Yeah. And if you want to really understand what's happening on the ground, you have to do real sentiment analysis right. uh, uh, that relies on a lot of meta-analysis, metadata, and a lot of, as you said, focus group you can't just go to a handful of CSOs, right? You can't just go to the AMP, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, back in the day, the AMP yeah, was considered yeah, yeah. More, yeah, yeah, yeah. more progressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now, if you really want to understand what's happening <laughs> on the ground as regards Gaza, you have to hold all these Summit. focus groups across a whole range of demographics, yeah. and you have to look at a whole range of metadata and data uh, about what people are saying on the individual platforms, right? Uh, so it's not about uh, the numbers a civil society organization has. I, in some part, how many members a CSO, the largest CSO has, could pale in comparison to the number of followers a teenage influencer yeah. has, right? Yeah. So that is, I think, where uh, a civil society is uh, moving uh, is towards a lot more. I think it's great. I think it's great because that's so empowering. It's so democratic. And the uh, to me, I've always thought that the objective of my work in civil society is to make myself not necessary or irrelevant. Mm. And that's now more than ever, uh, looking like it might just happen. And that's great because there, there, there are going to be a new generations of people that take the causes I care for so much further than I could ever even dream of because of the imaginative shackles on my horizon based on my experience. So, so, so that's, that was exactly what I wanted to ask you. Like, just, just, just the end of, I mean, and you know, uh, Every old person thinks this about younger people, right? They think they're a bit annoying. They don't have ins <laughs> insti institutional memory. But at the same time, the older people are also shackled yeah. by this, right? Yes. Sh shackled by experiences, real and imagined, and you draw these boundaries, right? So how do you balance this, basically? The enthusiasm of the young and the wisdom of the old. And I mean, in traditional... That is my daily work. <laughs> exactly, exactly, yeah. So in traditional civil society organizations, it's easy to do that, right? Or it's easier. But now, if there is a whole plethora of activists who are not involved in this... The thing is, though, you know, if you are looking at long-term change, right? So I think, like, for 
things, episodic things, Saga, Gaza, you know, it's episodic. Um, I, I think this kind of organizing works really well, right? Uh, just sort of coming together and you don't need to have actually a structure because you're right. just responding. But uh, if you are trying to change particular laws, etc., I think the you still need to have your organizations, right. your CSOs who are looking at that, like migrant issues, etc. Like, you know, there, there are long-term things uh, and structures and systemic barriers that we have to actually deal with. Sexual assault, you know, mm -hmm. aging of Singapore, like big, mm -hmm. big, big issues that are not easily solvable. Um, I, I think that so you sexy, still need right? that. The yeah, they're not. Singapore, uh, not, like, not it's necessary, all. but yeah. who wants to do it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Right. So, um, but it's, it's important. So the Workplace Fairness right. Act is, you know, something that right. is coming out. We're very excited that we've contributed to that and pushed for that because it makes a big difference to people's world, but it's not so sexy. Yeah. 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 Okay. Any final words from the two of you? Reflecting on your years in civil society. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I hope that it continues to strengthen, right? Um, and it's, and you have seen hopeful. it strengthened over the years because at, at, that, at that same uh, talk, uh, when I said that I have seen yeah. movements and there were a few people who said, no, actually, no, we haven't. Like, it's gotten worse for civil society. I think that if Saga mm. happened today, that we could, we would probably have maybe three times the number of people, maybe more, right? Mm. So I, I think mm. in, in, in that sense, it has strengthened. The, the culture, the consciousness has strengthened. Mm. Yeah. Um, but I do worry about like, you know, the traditional groups, whether or not there will be, we will get that support because I think the long-term issues are still important. The long-term strategy, I think that is, we, we can't do without that. And if we don't get support, then I don't know. Yeah. We would lose something. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think to, an to answer your question about what, uh, what we can do. Uh, I, I, I see my role in civil society as I kind of age out of certain frontline causes as one of providing expertise uh, that link to uh, uh, a particular point in history uh, as support, uh, as encouragement, um, and as holding space um, you speak like an old. Man. I, I know, I know. Yeah, he's been yeah. doing this since fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> but, but also, also, I think with you know, with, with this, with, with that time, also, I think comes with a bit of wisdom to know when to take myself out of certain right. conversations, yeah. and, and let other people, people fill that space. But <laughs> but you see, wouldn't yeah. that being in the space? For a very long time, actually, have yeah. the opposite effect. Right? A lot of people don't know when to withdraw. <laughs> you which, just support, yeah. That requires yeah, yeah. a high yeah, but, degree but, of self-consciousness. Yeah, <laughs> but there are different roles we fill, right? You know, as Karina said, I mean, at a particular point, you do need the lawyers in, you do need the experts in, you do need the researchers in, uh, to uh provide the technical expertise to say, hey, if we push for this legal change, uh, how are we going to draft the amendment? Right? How's the bill going to work? Yep. To provide the technical expertise to say this other country has done it in this particular way. This is a better way of doing a workplace fairness act, right? Uh, and that, that's one of the roles I guess the more senior activists can play, right? Uh, even as the yeah, the and the organizations. Right? Right? So that's right. Yes. People on the ground, like to say these are the issues. You don't have to be a member, but just the education, right? right? Take it up yourself. Yeah. Right. And to do that, you need resources and you need support yeah. and you need funding. Uh, and that will, I guess, necessarily shape and frame the way uh, you approach the state. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was an incredibly insightful <laughs> conversation. I really enjoyed it. I'm sure everyone benefited from it. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Rini. Thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Bye-bye.